I have to tell you that um, in preparation for this evening, I had the chance to talk with both of these scientists at length, and then I was, uh, I wouldn't say plagued, I was provided with lots of scientific articles to read, and I just became fascinated with mitochondria. Of course, I should be, because I'm an infectious disease clinician, and after all, mitochondria are just little bacteria that found their way inside of the cell. So they do have their origin in an area that I'm familiar with. But you know, when, I, when I had a chance to talk with both of these scientists, I realized that they do have a lot in common. Obviously, they're both of Indian descent, both of them at earlier stages of their career were interested in mathematics, a point that I'll come back to in a second. Um, they, they evolved under the tutelage of some extraordinary mentors, and you both have made reference to the importance of the mentors in the lab environments that you, um, you evolved your interests in. And independent of each other, operating in very distinct environments, they still simultaneously have developed this incredible passion for mitochondria. I don't know what you talk about when you have a glass of wine together, but I can guess. <laughs> so I'm going to start with you, Nav, and just go back in time. Um, you got your BA in mathematics from the University of Chicago. That seems kind of a far away distance from what you're doing right now. How did it happen that you found yourself with a PhD in this area and went on to, to develop this obsession that you have? Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, it turned out I wasn't going to be a great mathematician. <laughs> Even though I got a math degree from the University of Chicago, which is a very difficult place to get a math degree, um, you know, I wasn't going to solve Fermat's last equation or something important like that. Um, you know, I've always told my own trainees and people, one of the beautiful things about biology compared to math is math actually has an intellectual ceiling, and biology is an observational science, right? And I, I think, I really genuinely mean this, I think anyone can make an observation if they really try hard enough and they're dedicated to it. You go in the laboratory and you make an observation. Of course, the key is sometimes someone's observation might yield a breakthrough and others do doesn't. And uh, why that is and how people pick which observations to go after is the secret sauce. Uh, but, uh, but unlike math, uh, you know, after a while, it starts to look like hieroglyphics or ancient Greek to me. Uh, where in biology, every day, you can, someone in the lab makes an observation and that can excite you and push you into different directions. And sometimes those observations lead to breakthroughs and sometimes they don't, but that's okay. Can you say a word about your mentors along this pathway? Yeah, so uh, I've, uh, I was blessed uh, with uh, three mentors, uh, Paul Schumacher, Celeste Simon, and Craig Thompson. They were all very different. Um, uh, you know, Paul uh, is an engineer by background and also has a math, so rooted in logic. Uh, Craig Thompson, uh, who's, uh, who ran uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering that Vinod probably knows well, is a big thinker. Celeste Simon told me the importance of always use genetics uh, to show causality uh, as a way of uh, illuminating biology. And I think for me, this was the perfect combination. I always say I did the shortest postdoc of any living person that I know because, <laughs> because I had three mentors. Right? Typically, you do a six year postdoc, I ended up doing two because I had three mentors. You know, you could just squeeze them all in two years. So I was, I was blessed by, by having the three. So, Vamsi, let me talk with you a little bit about your background in mathematics. So, you may not know this because it's not necessarily in his bio, but he did win the science fair in Houston when he was a high school student by solving a really complicated <laughs> mathematics prize. And this led to an interview on NPR, which was heard around the world, apparently, because a, a mathematician in Hungary got in touch with you. So, tell us what happened. Sure. So, um... When I was in high school, uh, I had an early aptitude for uh, mathematics, and uh, uh, it came time for the science fair competitions. And most people were doing wet lab experiments, but that would be, you have to buy stuff. There's like liquids, and there's stuff you have to make. So I thought, why don't I just do a math project instead? It seemed like it may be a, a bit of a shortcut. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I actually ended up doing quite well. As Julie said, I ended up winning the Houston Science Fair. And then I ended up receiving this letter from this uh, Hungarian uh, mathematician that, le that lived in Texas. And the letter began by saying, congratulations on winning the Houston Science Fair. This is quite the accomplishment. Then the next line said, you should know that the problem that you solved was solved 300 years ago. <laughs> 
So <laughs> I had this incredibly sinking feeling. And then the next sentence read, but you're not expected to know this because you're living in Beaumont, Texas, and perhaps you haven't had the appropriate type of mentorship. <laughs> if you want to solve an original problem, please write back. And so the next few days, I just felt really, really, really down. And uh, after two days, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to take this person up on his, on his uh, opportunity. And I wrote back. And over the next couple of years, we would write snail mail letters back and forth. And uh, he really instilled in me a love for original research. And he also instilled in me, uh, I think, the importance of, of taste and aesthetic in science. He used to always talk about an elegant proof versus an inelegant proof. And as you commented earlier, there is something beautiful about science. And I think that was instilled in me at a, at a very, very early age to try to pursue original research that could also be elegant at the same time. Well, we're glad that you switched. But fast forward to the time I think you were more or less stranded in your cousin's house. You had no aspirations about mitochondria at that point in time until you noticed the books on the shelf while you were getting ready to sleep. And you picked one up, and lo and behold, there was a picture of a mitochondria in there. So Right. So uh, I transitioned from, I, I ended up studying math and computer science at Stanford and uh, loved it, and for various reasons uh, got involved in uh, computational analysis of DNA. And so I kind of got hooked on life sciences. And that interest brought me to a specific program at Harvard Medical School that was oriented for students that had math and physics backgrounds. And, uh, but it was an abrupt change from Stanford. I'm, I'm, I'm of Indian ancestry, genetically optimized for the sun. I grew up in Texas. <laughs> I went to Stanford. And here I was in Boston, and it was cold. There was so much memorization. It was intense. And I, I wasn't super, super happy as a first-year medical student. And I remember there's this one brief five-minute introduction to mitochondria in our pathology class. And the teacher showed an image of mitochondria, which is super beautiful, and commented that it used to be a bacterium, that it has its own DNA. And it just kind of stuck in the back of my mind that this was an interesting topic. But then a few weeks later, my dad's cousin got wind of the fact that I was unhappy. So she invited me to her house near the Somerville uh, Red Line. And as I was walking to her house, the snow started to come down. And I got stranded at my dad's cousin's place on a Friday night. And uh, so she warmed me up, she cooked a nice meal, and then she uh, created a makeshift bed for me. And as I was uh, falling asleep, I saw the Tyler textbook of mitochondria on the bookshelf. And to put myself to sleep, I just started flipping through it. <laughs> and uh, I remembered uh, hearing about it for five minutes in my medical school class. And that night, I would end up reading. I'm not joking. I'm not speaking in hyperbole, but I would literally read 100 pages that night and would check it out for my dad's cousin. And I was like, this is what I want to work on. So a passion was born. <laughs> so you have had an amazing series of observations in your lab. And I think we had a wonderful summary of them in our video. But I'd really like to talk a little bit more about why this is important, these, these signals that these mitochondria are doing. Because when I went through and read your bio and then looked at your papers, I realized that this is a very ubiquitous universe that this signaling may be relevant to. So what, what's the clinical implication of what you're doing? Yeah, so I'll just say, I think most of you, uh, when you think about mitochondria, it's called the powerhouse of the cell, right? Because it generates ATP. Uh, and people for a long time have linked mitochondrial dysfunction and at the heart of aging, neurodegeneration, cancer, etc. But when people in the last 25 years have closely looked at any particular disease other than primary mitochondrial disease, whereas primary mitochondrial disease is a disease that starts with a problem, a genetic cause in a mitochondrial protein being not properly made. Uh, but all these other diseases, people always said, oh, your ATP is not being generated by mitochondria. And that paradigm hasn't really totally panned out. And one of the things that we've recognized is beyond ATP, mitochondria release signals. These things can be signals like H2O2, yes, the bleaching agent, at very small doses, as 
mitochondrial DNA, lots of metabolites, which I'm very much interested in. And these are just normal signals uh, saying to the rest of the cell, oh, this is how we control health of the cell. These are normal signals to maintain health. And one idea is that in any disease, when someone says mitochondria are dysfunctional, is not to look at the fact that they don't make ATP, it's these signals either are not being made properly or are chronically activated. Right? And so why that's exciting, and maybe it's a ubiquitous paradigm as you suggested, is that when somebody says, oh, this disease might be linked to mitochondrial dysfunction, let's think of it as which of these signals didn't get made or is chronically activated and just fix the signal without worrying about fixing the mitochondria. So if you just take quickly an example like Parkinson's, I was just talk, talking to Dr. Paul about this. So Parkinson's is one of the uh, diseases that's very closely linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. People always say something about ATP, but it could be something else, one of these signals that's either not activated or is chronically activated by the person who's pre-symptomatic that might have mitochondrial dysfunction. It might be difficult to fix that, but maybe if you know the signals, you can intervene at those signals, either turn them on or turn them off. Uh, and that, I think, is a new way to think about it. But this paradigm, as you rightfully suggested, could apply to many diseases mm -hmm. where someone says, oh, something wrong with mitochondria. So we're at the 1.0 stage. We are very much 1.0 stage. Mm -hmm. And the next generation will be at the 2.0, and it will hopefully have impact directly in medicine. So, Vamsi, I have a family member who has a mitochondrial disorder. Um, she was diagnosed as an adult, but she's quite challenged by this disease. And, you know, obviously when we hear genetic diseases and gene therapy, we would like to think, oh, great, CRISPR, let's fix this problem. But that's a lot more challenging when the problem is in the mitochondria. What are the prospects for addressing some of these abnormalities, either in the mitochondrial genes, which as you said, are just the handful, or the 1100 genes that are in the nucleus that also interact and, and have important functions vis-a-vis -vis the mitochondria. Are, are we on the horizon of therapies that can address some of these issues? So, I mean, uh, first of all, I'm really sorry to hear that you have a family member with uh, mitochondrial disease. These are super, super challenging diseases. I mean, typically patients will see a median of seven physicians even before a diagnosis is even ascertained. And we really don't have any truly, truly effective medicines. And as of today, there are 300 monogenic mitochondrial diseases. So it's a very large collection of individually rare diseases. And, um, and as you said, some of them are due to mutations in the mitochondrial DNA, uh, and then some of them are due to mutations in the nuclear DNA. Uh, and uh, out of those 300 genes, of course, because only 13 proteins are made by the mitochondrial genome, the, the vast majority of those genes are nuclear. And for those gene editing, gene replacement, bespoke gene therapies, these are all excellent prospects. For the mitochondrial DNA, CRISPR does not work in the mitochondrion. It's very difficult to get RNA into the mitochondrion. And even if you could get the Cas9 protein and the RNA in, Mitochondria do not like linearized uh, DNA. It'll get chopped up very quickly, so it's very, very challenging. But one exciting thing is my colleague, uh, David Liu, uh, at the Broad Institute, and Joseph Mojos at the University of Washington in Seattle. Joseph uh, discovered a new deaminase that operates on double-stranded DNA, and David Liu engineered it so that he could fuse it to what are called tail ends so that they could be programmable base editors and we help them get it into the mitochondrion so that in a CRISPR independent way, we can now edit for the first time mitochondrial DNA. Now, I think the good news is we can now model mitochondrial DNA in a dish for the first time. Until now, we had to wait until we, have, we saw a patient that has an mtDNA disease and then study those cells. But now for the first time, we, can, we can't make every possible edit, but we can make a lot. And I think that's gonna be great for modeling these diseases in a dish or in animals. But I think in terms of uh, using base editing as a therapy, I think w we have a, a solid decade. Uh, we're on version 1.0, and we really need to, we need to get to about, about 5.0 before we can really enter into humans. So we shouldn't be lining up the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium to weigh in on this quite yet. For the nuclear genes, absolutely. For the nuclear genes. But, and the but not for the mtDNA. Got it. 
So you, you made reference to your collaborators at the Broad, and both of you um, were very generous in recognizing uh, your lab teams as really the unit of success here. So while we give the Lurie Prize to individual scientific stars, um, we all recognize that it's team science. And since we really stand for team science at the FNH, I'd like to just get a little bit more of your perspective on that. Um, when you build your lab, you, how, how do you decide who to hire and who to bring into your team? And you know, you're assembling a wise crowd, so to speak, but how do you actually pick and choose? I'm sure you've got people lined up who'd love to work mm -hmm. with you. I, mean, I, I feel super fortunate to be able to lead a, a super, super diverse, passionate, uh, multidisciplinary team. So I just wake up every morning, lucky I can work with these people. We do have a saying in the lab, whenever we're trying to recruit somebody into the lab, we use a two by two grid strategy. Everyone is either brilliant or not brilliant. <laughs> and everyone is either a jerk or not a jerk. <laughs> so we try to sample from the upper right quadrant. Okay? <laughs> people that are brilliant but not jerks. And people can be brilliant in different ways. They can, they can, they can, they can be really hard working. They can have a special spark. They can be creative. They can have a high IQ. Many ways of uh, being brilliant. Uh, unfortunately, there's many ways of being a jerk as well. But <laughs> by, by sampling from the upper right quadrant, I think we've just built an incredible culture. And I think the other element of our team is that um, uh, we, 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 within our group, on the one hand, we have folks that are just pursuing science in a really curiosity-driven manner. On the other hand, we also work on diseases where we have a healthy sense of urgency in the problems that we pursue. So I love the fact that we have both of these elements uh, in, in, a, in a really kind laboratory. Thank you for that. Now, now, you and I have talked a little bit about the selection of students and trainees in your lab and mentoring. Share with us a little bit about your philosophy of how you nurture and support your, your students, your postdocs, and your early career scientists. Yeah, so uh, um, I don't have a complicated grid like you do. You're still uh, holding on to your math. I've, you know, I have trouble uh, adding a tip these days. You know, they moved, once they moved it to 20 to 22 percent, it became tricky. Um, but, you know, for me, it's really simple. I ask a simple question, do you like metabolism? Um, and if you waver, well, I sort of like it. No, no, I love it. It, I'm, I'm sold, right? Because then they're going to be passionate about what I'm passionate about, which is the, the, the big world of metabolism and mitochondria is at the center of that. Uh, and then I really ask them what aspect do they want to study. Some of them want to study clinical diseases. Some of them want to study a very basic question. And I don't hinder them because I figure as long as they like metabolism, we can communicate. And then they can take that in any direction they want from crazy things like metformin to Parkinson's to cancer, et cetera. Uh, I allow them to own their project because I figure if they own their project, it's, you know, they can't blame me when things go bad, right? <laughs> it's your project. <laughs> it has to be metabolism. Now I understand why you wrote a book, Navigating Metabolism. Yes, yes. yes. I'll, I'll it's a great clear. holiday gift. Um, <laughs> we all got to make a living. <laughs> Amazon.com. <laughs> Last year's Lurie Prize winner wrote a scathing remark on it. So there's one person who has a one star, but the rest are all five stars. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Bad joke. Well, in the course of this conversation, you actually both, um, in, in one way or another, really talked about challenging dogma, challenging the dogma that what the mitochondria are there for is to be the powerhouse of the cell, or challenging the dogma about uh, the mitochondria DNA being the important unit of interest when, in fact, it's the nuclear chromosome that contains the most of, of, the, of the relevant um, opportunities for intervention. So talk about you know, the process of science and, and, and challenging dogma and how you face up to the criticism or the status quo that you no doubt have to be a salmon and swim upstream against. I'll, I'll start with you on this one. It's, it's really simple. Um, if your paper gets rejected once, you'll be mad. You'll repackage it. It'll be rejected again. You'll continue to be mad. By the fourth or the fifth time it's being rejected, you should rejoice. 
because you know you're on to something that nobody <laughs> else is on to. And it's true. I can honestly tell you uh, the, the papers that, uh, were, that I uh, uh, cited, uh, and I always cite, that made my career uh, were perhaps not in those famous boutique journals. Uh, one of them, uh, in our cancer, uh, 11 journals rejected it. True story, 11 journals rejected the paper because it challenged the dogma that mitochondria are not dysfunctional in most cancers. Um, and at that time, I'll be honest, I was really depressed and down. It was about 10, 12 years ago. But today, when I get those rejections, I rejoice. <laughs> as, because as long as I'm comfortable in knowing that we did it properly and controlled, you know, because by the time something becomes so big, uh, you know, lots of people are doing it, but if you're way ahead of the game, then most people think you're, a, you're out to lunch, and uh, you know, that happens a lot to me. <laughs> Mumsy? How about your experience in challenging dogma? So, um, I think there's so many uh, examples of uh, professors that did not get tenure because, you know, they had controversial ideas or ideas that didn't fall into the mainstream, and subsequently, you know, we then recognized them as being the ones that were really the pioneers. And so there's this old saying that genius is hitting the target that other people can't even see. And I think sometimes when people, um, you know, put up these barriers, uh, you have to just view it as potentially a, a sign that you're onto something uh, bigger and better than they even recognize. So I think it's a part of our job. We can't take it too personally. Uh, sometimes the papers get in very, very quickly. Sometimes we have to, uh, you know, resubmit the three, four, <laughs> ten times. So that's, that's a part of our job. <laughs> part of science, right? But if I could just say that the point about the tenure is really pertinent because this year's Nobel Prize was given right. to Kerry Catlin, who didn't right. get tenure right. Right. at Penn in the mid to late 90s uh, for the mRNA vaccine, uh, the pioneering work for mRNA vaccines. So that's right. a great example of, right. of someone who was way, way ahead right. of and now is being rightfully celebrated. Finally honored. Yeah. Finally, Finally honored. honored. Yeah, so. Well, we're happy to honor both of you tonight with the Lurie Prize, mm -hmm. and I hope you feel like these represent rock stars of science mm -hmm. and that the work going on in their labs and in their collaborating environments is truly meritorious and deserving of this award. It really represents team science at its best, and I think we're all really proud to have you be part of the FNIH community. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you.